Okay. All right. And if everything's all right, I'll, I'll get underway. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, uh, as I was very kindly introduced, uh, I'm Ezzy Pearson. I'm a features editor over at Sky at Night magazine, um, which basically means it's my job to be a professional space enthusiast um, and, and get excited about space and tell people about it. Um, but today I'm going to talk about what was actually my very first sort of journalistic experience. Um, taking you back in time 10 years ago and two days to the 15th of February 2013 when the Chelyabinsk meteor um, set me on my current career path. And we're going to, uh, as well as traveling back in time, we're going to travel across Europe to the Chelyabinsk Oblast region, uh, which is a region in the Russia, uh, towards the southern uh, border of Russia. And it was about nine o'clock in the morning on the 15th of February 2013. Everybody was heading off to work um, nine o'clock in the morning, minding their own business when something quite unusual appeared in the sky overhead. I don't know whether you'll be able to hear the audio for this as well, but it shouldn't matter too much for this one. So here, it's everybody was heading to work and suddenly this incredibly bright light started shining in the sky. <clears throat> now here you can really see how bright it was. It was really outshining the sun, only for like a, a second or so, but really, really bright. And people who were slightly further away could see it coming across the night sky a bit, but still very bright. Suddenly flaring up and then fading away. And of course, this was about 9.20 a.m. local time, and people were wondering, well, what on earth is this? What's going on? Um, you know, you don't expect to see this kind of like massively bright light in the sky uh, uh, when you're heading off to work. Um, and people did what you would expect them to do. Everybody went outside to have a look and they went towards uh, their windows to get a look, which was rather unfortunate because two to three minutes later, this happened. <clears throat> this huge explosion uh, rocked through the town. It was so forceful that it, it knocked people off their feet. It blew out windows. Set off car alarms. And you might have heard there, there was actually a second explosion afterwards. We'll come back to that one. Yes, a section of a factory wind, um, ceiling just fell through. And one person got straight blown through a wall. Uh, I always wait to say that one because it's my favourite. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it was this incredibly strong blast. Uh, it was felt as much as 100 kilometres away from, from the town of Chelyabinsk. People felt this um, and, and heard it as well. And unfortunately, there were, as I said, there was people who'd rushed to the window to, to look at this thing and it blew out all of the windows, it shattered glass. There was about 1,500 people ended up in hospital having been injured by this, this, this blast, this shockwave that had happened. Fortunately, nobody seriously. Um, mostly it was, it was from the glass. There was a couple of people who even had retina and sunburn because the light was so bright, it burnt them. Um, and it caused about 1 billion rubles worth of damage which is about two, 20 million pounds worth of damage. And it must have been so incredibly scary if this had just happened to you. Apparently there was a smell of sulfur in the air. You could smell burning and ashes. Um, and in some places they even heard something appearing to rain down out of the sky um, and, and hitting on the roofs of their building. And of course there was a bit of panic 
some politicians even jumped the gun a bit and said, you know, oh, started talking about missile attacks. And that's what people were also talking about as well. Mm. But it was that rain falling on the roof that very quickly clued people into what this was. It was, in fact, a meteor that had exploded overhead. So just quickly, what is a meteor? I'm sure all of you are very familiar with the term. You've heard it before. You know, you've been, I'm sure you've all been to see meteor showers and, and such like that. But a meteor is specifically the point when something is in the atmosphere. If something's in space, it's called a meteoroid, an asteroid, um, space rock, something like that. When it hits the Earth's atmosphere, that's when it begins to, to glow bright white. Um, and a lot of people think it's actually like the meteor that's catching fire and happening. And that's where the light comes from. But it's not. It's actually what's happening is these things hit the atmosphere so fast that they squish the atmosphere. They squish the air so much that it super, super heats. And it's that really hot air that creates this bright white glow that we see um, and that really sort of seems to illuminate things um, because they do get extremely hot. Um, and then any parts that reach the ground, those are what we call meteorites. Um, I do try and keep those ones straight in my head. I might occasionally misspeak. If I do, I'm very sorry. Um, but at the time that this uh, meteor did, did explode over Chelyabinsk, there were people who were actually um, looking up and ex looking at another asteroid because there did happen to be another asteroid passing Earth at this, this time. It was called 2012 DA14. Uh, asteroids don't tend to get very fancy names unless they, you know, hit Earth. Um, and, well, they do eventually get named after people and so on and so forth, but they always have these very long-winded designations to begin with. Um, and that one was about the size of an office block. But and it was going to be coming 27,000 kilometers away from Earth, which is a pretty close path. So it was actually getting a lot of press. And when the news of this first started did going on, people thought maybe this was an associated meteor. But very, very quickly, people could establish that this wasn't. This was a new thing. This was a meteor we had not seen coming at all. <laughs> um, and the reason for that was because it was coming out of the sun. So this was a common tactic that I know a lot of fighter pilots tend to use, especially during the world wars, which is if you come in flying out of the sun, the glare hides you. And that's exactly what happened with the meteor. Um, and the blast that we felt was that meteor breaking apart in the atmosphere. Now, this wasn't the first time that this part of Russia had experienced this kind of, of phenomenon before. Um, in fact, about almost 100 years, um, over 100 years earlier, in 1908, another meteor had exploded over the region of Tunguska, which is relatively close by. And that time, it was it was very, very remote. Nobody was around to see it. Um, people heard it miles and miles away, which is why they came to investigate it. And they found that loads of trees had been knocked down. Um, there was one or two very startled deer and some deer that didn't fare very well, um, but luckily no people, as far as we know, were hurt. But because it was so remote, there was mm -hmm. nobody around to be able to see it. And that, as we just saw from all of the footage, was very much not true with this meteor. Mm -hmm. There were thousands of people who witnessed this event. People had recorded it on their dash cams and their phones. And that's what made this event so incredibly exciting because people could immediately start tracing where this had come from. And where it had come from was this region here. So it had come just south of uh, Chelyabinsk. That's where it had been seen. And it was seen coming from the east moving west mm. towards this region here lake yeah. chibakal yeah. and in fact we're pretty they were pretty sure that was where it finally ended up because some people went and looked in the region and found an eight meter wide hole in a frozen lake now they couldn't be a hundred percent sure that this had anything to do with the the meteor and the meteorites um but generally speaking, if there's a big hole in your lake in the morning and there wasn't one there in the afternoon and you know something's coming towards you, chances are you can probably say that it, that's where it was from. 
but as the day was progressing, as they found out about this this whole in Lake Jabarkal and, and people were beginning to upload all of their, their footage and, and tell their stories on social media, the rest of the world was beginning to wake up. So this happened at about 3 a.m. GMT, but as the rest of the world woke up, more and more information was getting picked up and, and other people around the world were sending in their own information as well. This is a uh, signal measured by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization's International Monitoring System. And what that is, is it's basically a listening station. It listens out for um, the explosions from tests of uh, nuclear weapons that aren't supposed to be happening um, so that, you know, we can people can go and deal with that. But uh, this is from the station that was in, in Kazakhstan. It uses infrastructure infrasound which is the opposite of ultrasound so very very low frequency sound waves and those can travel incredibly incredibly far um, of the 45 stations around the world 17 stations heard this signal uh, the furthest away was in antarctica which was 15,000 kilometers away and that managed to measure the blast uh, but kazakhstan was one of the closer ones which was why it got the sort of like best <laughs> view and this was really exciting because it managed to well for the first thing is the experts could look at this and straight away say that's not a, a bomb or anything that is very much a meteor that's the, mm -hmm. the signal that a meteor looks like the other thing was they could tell how much energy it put into the atmosphere it put in 500 kilotons of energy into the atmosphere that is the equivalent of 30 times the bomb that dropped on hiroshima this was a huge amount of energy that got released by this thing. And that allowed people to start getting a gauge of how big the meteor was. It was probably somewhere in the region originally before it hit Earth's atmosphere, somewhere in the region of anywhere between one and 50 meters of size. Um, that would get narrowed down a bit later. It was also they could tell that this thing was traveling faster than the speed of sound because they also managed to measure it breaking the sound barrier as well. So this was an incredibly fast object that hit the surface. But also, as I said, there was lots of people who had dash cam. And in this case, this is actually a CCTV piece of footage. Um, and very quickly, uh, lots of people at various places around the world um, gathered their, this information off of the web um, and started doing analysis like this. So somebody basically took this video went onto Google Maps to work out, like estimate how tall they thought the um, lampposts were, how far apart they were, and work out how fast this meteor was moving across the sky and, and what direction it was going. And eventually they also, they, they created something that looked a bit like this, which is, this is basically a plot showing the, the probability area of where they think the meteor was passing, um, assuming that, you know, taking various points that it was seen in various different footage, the angle it was going at, putting the final point in Lake Chabarkal down at the bottom of where it was ended up, and they managed to, to sort of predict something of a path. Um, eventually that would get a bit more refined as they got more and more readings in. And eventually they managed to, to tell quite a lot of information about this. It was uh, traveling at 19 kilometers per second. That's how fast it was going, 19 kilometers per second. Um, hit Earth at a fairly shallow angle, about 18 degrees. And it exploded at about 30 kilometers up. And that's what caused the shockwave. So basically what happened as it was traveling so quickly through the atmosphere, it got so hot that the rock couldn't withstand that, those, those kind of internal temperatures anymore. And so it broke apart. And when it broke apart, it broke apart with such speed that it created a, a shock wave that came off as it moved the air out of the way. And actually, um, as they saw again from the, um, this diagram over here, you can see that there are several peaks throughout this, and that's because it didn't just explode once, it exploded seven times as it broke apart seven different times. There was one initial one that was very big and then a lot of little ones. Um, and 
that was what caused this great big shockwave. But why did they care so much about finding where this meteor had come from? What, what was the point? Well, if you can plot its path and how it came into Earth, you can extrapolate that back to work out its orbit. And that was what they tried to do. And so here you can see uh, where, where they think the orbit was, um, the, the various error bars on the blue lines. So it came in to, towards the sun to about just, just within the orbit of Earth, crossed of Earth's orbit twice, and then came out to Mars. And it had probably been taking this path for many, many years, possibly tens of thousands, millions perhaps even of years, and been quite happily crossing over Earth's orbit. It's just that this time Earth happened to be in the way. Um, so this uh, video will sort of just gives you an idea of kind of where it is and, and how it's fairly in plane with our motion around the sun as well. <laughs> but now things are moving. You can see the meteoroid came by Earth's um, orbit absolutely fine a couple of years before the event, even just before the event. But this time it struck because Earth happened to be there. And that's really important because once we know the path, we can also even then start trying to work out where this originated from. Because as we know, um, all asteroids, or the vast majority of asteroids that we know of are in the asteroid belt. And in fact, most of the asteroids that are outside of the asteroid belt started in the asteroid belt or have been there at at least some point in the past. Um, and we know that, uh, come on to that later, uh, but there are ones in the asteroid belt, which are the ones here that are shown in white. Now, some of these occasionally through various collisions and interactions get sent off into other orbits. So any that come in towards Earth are, are called near, uh, any that are within, I think it's 1.3 AU of Earth um, are classed as near Earth asteroids. Um, there are some that are even more inner than that, but they tend to just get pulled in towards the sun eventually. And we actually think that this, uh, the Chelyabinsk meteor was part of what was known as the Apollo meteors, uh, the Apollo asteroids, uh, which is a, a group of near Earth asteroids. There are also other groups of asteroids that get kicked out of the solar, like out further into the solar system. Um, lots of them tend to end up in, in Jupiter as uh, got some gravitational stable points where space rocks like to hang out. Um, and uh, so the, the asteroid belt is between Jupiter and Mars, so it's quite relatively close by. We know that all of the, most of these asteroids um, or most of the meteorites that end up on Earth were originally in the, come from the asteroid belt or come from asteroids because of another Russian meteor that struck about 50 years before, 19, in 1974, again, on the 12th of February. Um, so again, very close in the date as well. And that was the, this one I don't know how to pronounce. I think it's Skihote Ailin meteor. Um, and this one fell near the Sea of Japan, so the very other side of Russia. And they, this again was seen by a lot of people. They managed to trace back it, its orbit. And using that, that was the first sort of big piece of evidence that they had that yes, meteorites and asteroids, those are the same thing. Um, and now that the, the, they knew the path of the asteroid, people were now much more concerned with about finding what bits might be left behind. Because as it broke apart, all of those uh, pieces of, of, of meteor, the second that you have, uh, if you have a big lump of space rock traveling through the air, it moves quite efficiently. It, like, it really doesn't care about air resistance. It's too big, it's too heavy, it's too fast. The second it starts breaking apart into smaller fragments, air resistance suddenly becomes a problem and it stops that tiny fragment almost immediately and they just fall straight out to the sky. 
So as this thing was breaking apart and creating all of these tiny fragments, it was raining meteorites down along its path as it went. And so here on this map, you can see the yellow areas are where each of the explosions happened. Um, and I think the width is sort of related to how much energy they put in. But the red areas are where the meteorites fell. Um, they got blown a bit by the wind. That large red area is where there were so many that they couldn't put individual dots in. But you can see it, it, there was loads of meteorites that were, were found throughout and rained down across this region. And these meteorites, in fact, were found uh, by people from the Ural Federal University in St. Catherinesburg, um, which has a very uh, extensive meteorite department. Because as it happens, Russia is a very, especially Russia in February, is a very, very good place to go hunting for meteorites because it's covered in snow. And the weather was also very good at that time of year because as it's heading into spring, it's not snowing as much. You've just got the snow that's already there. But why is that so good? The problem with when you're trying to find meteorites, one of the big problems that you find time and again is that they just look like rocks. Um, they look like ordinary stones you would find on the ground. So how do you know what's a meteorite and what's just a pebble? If you've got a nice flat white landscape, like the, the uh, like a snowfield, then if you see any rocks sitting on the top, they're not going to have just jumped up there from under the snow. You know that they must have fallen from the sky. And actually what happens, because they are so hot by the time they fall, fall from the sky, they actually melt a little hole. So what people were doing was they were going out and trying to find all of these like tiny holes out in the snowfields. And of course, news of this, a fall of this size very, very quickly spread around the world. And people from all over the world started to, to come and try and find these meteorites. There were researchers from the local university and, you know, they were the most kind of like they wanted to get as many as they could because they knew a lot of them were going to get taken. There's people who came from, you know, the States and all around the world to, to collect them so that they can sell them later. Um, also, a lot of the local kids were out there um, trying to find their, their own rocks so that they could sell them to the people who'd come or sell them on the Internet uh, to raise money to like, I think it was buy an iPod. That was the big thing that a lot of the kids wanted to do. Um, and I know that because uh, also there were some media people who got sent out there, including myself. Uh, I was asked to go out there and uh, shoot a documentary for Channel 4, which had the very impressive title of um, Meteor Strike Fireball from Space, um, which I thought was a very good title. But we went out there and we did actually go out and try and hunt the fields for um, meteorites. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't get there for a couple of weeks, by which time most of the good ones had been picked over. Uh, we did manage to find this. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on the camera, but this very tiny little one here um, was, I say we found it. I was the one person who found it on camera, but it was actually the director. Uh, I think it was the producer, actually, who, who found it um, before I got there. And then a uh, little bit of stage magic. To, for me to find it on camera but the way that you go searching for one of these meteorites because I did find that out is you go looking for these tiny holes in the the, the ice um, in the snow and sometimes it'll be a mouse hole sometimes it will be you know the dripping from a tree that's made this hole or something but if you want to investigate it what you do you don't just go sort of like digging down into the hole you scrape around it clearing away all of the snow and get closer and closer and closer. Oops, sorry, hit my mouse there. Um, until you've, you've just got sort of like the snow surrounded by a little bit of tunnel. Go down as low as you can and try and scoop it out. And what you hopefully should find is kind of like this little hard column of ice and snow um, with a meteor, a, a, a rock kind of cemented in the end of it. And that's because as it's very hot, it's come down, it's melted all of the snow and the ice, and then that snow and ice has reset and welded itself onto the rock. And so that's one of the really good ways that you can tell that this rock is actually uh, a meteorite. 
and not just a snow uh, and not just a pebble or mouse droppings as there were quite a few mice um but a lot of them did get found and uh Though some of them did get taken away by uh, people who were trying to sell them, um, and in fact, you know, the local kids, I say that I was one of them, and this is the this is the slightly larger one that I ended up buying off of the local kids over here, um, which is a very nice one. It sits on my desk, um, but most of them got taken off to the Ural Federal University in the Institute of Physics and Technology uh, in St. Catherinesburg, which was about. I think it was four hours away, um, which in Russian terms, right around the corner. Uh, but what was they they managed to find quite a, a quite a haul. Um, so the one that you can see in my hands here and also in uh, Viktor Gorovsky's hands, um, that was about a kilometer, uh, about a kilometer, about a kilogram. Uh, so this was thing was really heavy. And that was the one of the biggest individual chunks that was found. But they also found lots of little fragments. Um, but so what was surprising was they still only found, you know, like a couple of kilos worth. This was this meteorite would have been about uh, the meteoroid originally would have probably been about 20 meters across, something like that, weighing something between 10 and 20 tons, 20, 10 and 20,000 tons. Why was so little material reaching the ground? Um, and to be honest, this was actually quite expected. Uh, of the 10 to 20,000 tons, probably only three to, four thousand, three to four tons made it to the ground. So, you know, one a fraction of a percent made it to the ground. Most of it was vaporized. So that intense heat just burnt it away into vapor and it entered into the Earth's atmosphere. Some of it was broken apart into tiny fragments so that it fell as dust. Um, but some of them did make it to, to the ground as these sort of like pebble sized rocks. But the biggest payday that would have to wait until the autumn. And that was the lump that was left in Lake Chebarkle. And they and, and when the summer rolled, because they knew at the time, like you don't want to go trying and getting this in the middle of February out of a lake in Russia that's frozen over. That's that's a very bad move. So they waited until the summer and the lake had thawed, uh, did a lot of analysis of the region, you know, did radar and um, sonar to try and locate this thing, eventually found it um, and raised it up from the lake. That was quite an effort. It took them, I think, two goes to try and get it up. They had to pump away so much mud beforehand, uh, but they did eventually manage it on the 16th of October. And they got it on, they, they spent a lot of effort trying to put this, raise this thing up in one piece. Um, they managed to finally get it onto the scales. Uh, then they broke the scales and then they broke the meteor. Uh, unfortunately, they tried really hard to keep it in one piece, but it wasn't having any of it, and it broke into three fragments instead. They did eventually manage to to weigh it um, as four five hundred and forty kilos, I think, is the official weight now, which is about the same as an old-fashioned mini, like a mini classic. So that's the kind of weight that we were talking about here. But they did, now that they had their samples, it was now time to try and understand a bit more about what this rock was. And to do that, they did various tests. Um, whilst I was there, they were already beginning to put it under a scanning electron microscope to get a up close view of what it looked like, look at its nano uh, materials and structures there. Um, and this is what you can see it looked like. And they managed to establish what kind of meter it was, you know, by testing its its composition and so on to find out that it was a chondrite. So a chondrite is a stony, uh, a stony type of meteorite, doesn't tend to have a lot of metals in it. This one, in fact, had incredibly low levels of metal. Um, and these types of uh, Chondrites make up about 85% of all meteors that we know about. Um, they are one of the most common forms of meteorites that, that get to Earth. Uh, and 
they're really interesting because we think they are some of the, the leftovers from the building blocks of the planets. And you can see that in the fact that this one was about 4.5 billion years old. That was its original age. It was created about 4.5 billion years ago, which is the, sa the same age as the solar system, basically. So this thing was incredibly, incredibly old. The final measurements uh, or estimates about its uh, initial size was that it was 13,000 tons and 19 meters across. So quite a big thing and very old. But what was also really interesting about it was that it was um, shot through with these things called shock veins. So you will see here down on the right, um, this is a sort of close up of one of the meteorites. Now that black crust that's around it, that was caused as it was coming through the atmosphere, the atmosphere superheated that outer layer and kind of like melted it and burnt it a bit to create this like thick black crust. And that's kind of one of your like telltale signs that you've got a meteorite. If you're looking, if you've got a stony meteorite, it has that kind of crust on it. Um, and you can also see it's got various shiny minerals and things on it. Um, you can tell it's like I said it had low levels of iron, but it does have uh, low levels of metal, but it did have some iron in uh, which you can see because that iron is now starting to rust, which is what those orange patches are. But also it had these things called shock veins running through it. So these are black veins going throughout the rock. Um, and again, I don't know if this is going to pick it up on the camera, but on my one that I've got here, you can very clearly see that there's this like black sh line that goes right the way across the centre bit. And that's what's called a shock vein. And those are created when in the distant past, uh, the, the space rock, the asteroid was in a collision with another space rock. Um, the, the shocks and tremors that go through it create these lines where, where the rock gets incredibly, incredibly heated, melts and forms these dark lines that go through it. And these are very weak points throughout the rock. Uh, and one of the reasons why it broke apart so much and why it crumbled so much. This thing is incredibly crumbly. I have to be quite careful with mine because otherwise it, like, it does start turning into dust. Um, Asteroids are really not very well held together. <laughs> They're really not. Um, and that's what we said. And so they, there was a lot of very initial kind of like, what kind of meteorite is this? What can it tell us about the universe um, and the solar system? But then as people sort of got the basics of it and they realized that, yes, it's a very old meteorite, but it's kind of not very interesting. Uh, the Chelyabins meteorite has sort of just been kind of Despite its very interesting start in life, it was eventually just sort of became another meteorite in our big catalogue, admittedly one with a lot of, you know, examples out there. Um, but some people have started paying attention to it again in recent years because there was one very big question left around the meteorite, and that was its impact history. So we know it has these shock veins. We know it has been impacted in the past. But when, how many times was it one of these impacts that sent it on its way in towards the solar system and its date with Chelyabinsk in Russia? You know, um, and that question's always been a bit difficult to answer. There's been various different people saying various different things. Um, I think at one point, some people said that there was as many as, as eight different impacts throughout, you know, over the last 4.5 billion years. But there has been some recent research on this uh, by a person called Craig uh, Walton, who I spoke to a couple of months ago, um, and he's been doing some some tests. Uh, and I thought this was a really good example to say, like, show how you actually say how old a meteorite is, because that seems like a very odd question. How do you tell how old a rock is? And one of the clear ways to do that is to look at something called uh, its isotopic ratios. So um, in this case, uh, what Craig was looking for was looking at uranium and lead. So when uranium decays via it's a radioactive material, it decays and it forms lead. And so you find both of these throughout the Chelyabinsk rock. Very, very small doses. I am fine to be next to it. Don't worry. Um, but 
these both of these get trapped in various minerals uh, within the rock called phosphates when the rock gets really hot the lead can escape but the uranium stays put so by looking at the ratio of uranium and lead you can work out when um that that phosphate last got hot so by looking at the ones that are inside these shock veins uh craig was able to to measure how old the 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 impact was and he found that there seems to have been two big impacts uh one was initially like very early on in the the career of this this asteroid about 4.48 billion years ago so that is very very early on in our solar system about the same time as the moon formed we'll come back to that in a minute the other one was at some point within the last million years um possibly a little but you need that sort of order of magnitude sometime within the last million or so years um, and that was probably the one that chipped it in its way towards the inner solar system and its date with us so that seems to be what happened but knowing that impact history really does sort of showcase why no understanding meteorites and asteroids is so important to our understanding of the solar system because these are the building blocks from the planets being formed. So a lot of asteroids um, are either parts of planets that uh, either the stuff that was left over that could have formed a planet, but then never kind of got conglomerated together. So never even made it into a planet. And that's what this kind of meteorite was, what these chondrites are. They are the bits that never got used. They're completely unprocessed. But there's also some which did start becoming planets and by but we can see those so they started becoming planets but a lot of the the planetoids they were called so these initial infant planets never quite made it they were either blown apart uh, through collisions uh, or or something like that which broke them apart and scattered their remains throughout the solar system um but they had got to the stage where they were starting to what's called differentiate so when a an object gets big enough i think it's around about a thousand kilometers across no the thousand kilometers is when it starts making itself spherical but when you get to to a couple like several thousand kilometers across uh the the gravitational pressure becomes so great that the heat becomes so great that all of the the, the material inside a planet starts to melt and it starts to separate out with all the heavy things sinking to the bottom and the the, the lighter stuff floating on the top. Um, they start forming those big metallic cores uh, with a mantle and a crust. And you can get different parts of the planet form different kinds of meteors. So iron meteorites, which we have quite a few of here on Earth, they form within the, the cores, that's what left of the cores. And this is the only way we're ever going to get to see a planetary core. Like we just, <coughs> there's no way we could like drill down through the mantle to be able to see one of these things. Um, there's some of the earliest sources of iron on the planet as well. Um, uh, you know, they really did use to forge swords out of star metal. That's not like a fantasy trope. Um, and even though they are only 5% of meteorites by number, they are 90% of the mass of meteorites that are found because they are very, very heavy. Um, they also have this really cool thing called a Widsman Statin pattern, um, which is basically when, because of the way that the iron inside of them cools, um, it creates these really long ordered crystals of iron and you can make them polish up and, and look really nice, um, make very good jewelry. There's also palisites. Those are the ones that come from the uh, mantle core boundary between uh, uh, the mantle and the core. And they have these olivine uh, sort of gemstones within them linked together with, with various metals. Uh, those ones are quite rare. There's only 61 uh, falls of these known. 10 found in Antarctica because it's easy to find places where it's snowy. Uh, and you know, those ones are very collectible, very sought after. Sometimes they can be absolutely huge, 
as we can see here. However, those ones are also very fragile. They tend to fall apart a lot. So these give us a lot of our ideas about how our planets formed and how they, you know, they give us insights into parts of planets we'd never normally be able to get to see. But by looking at these, the bits that kind of got kicked out and, and left over, we can understand, you know, what composition were they? How did they separate out? We've also actually managed to get some meteorites from planets that did make it all the way to adulthood. Um, or in one case, a moon that made it all its way to adulthood. Um, and we know that that's where these meteorites come from because we've sent missions there. We've sent missions to Mars, we sent missions to the moon. We know what those rocks should look like. Uh, so when you add, people have analyzed these, they've managed to backtrack where it is and what they've come from. It is possible that we might have had um, meteorites from Venus or Mercury. Uh, it's unlikely because the, the gravity well's going the wrong way. But if we did, we wouldn't know what they looked like. So those are the only ones that we can identify. But as they give us, uh, again, that gives us another window into studying another planet, uh, which helps us again to understand our own planet and, and understand about its formation. Because that's another reason why meteorites and asteroids are so fascinating, because we think asteroids themselves played a part in our own planet's formation. Um, when a planet differentiates out, all of the heavy stuff should sink to the bottom, into the core. So why can we find things like iron and gold and all of those lovely metals in the crust? And one of the ways that we think that might have occurred is it was brought in later by meteorites. And we know that our, our, um, our planet has been shaped by, by huge impacts, the most uh, important of which is probably 4.5 billion years ago, something the size of Mars slammed into the proto-Earth and we ended up with the moon. And as I said, one of the big uh, impacts that appears to have happened to Chelyabinsk happened at the same time as that moon was going on. And in fact, what we've managed to see from several different kinds of um, meteors and analysis of those is that around that time, there was a lot of impacts going on. It really does look like there was some kind of planetary shuffle up going on around that time that was sending things flying around all over the place. And so that's one of the ways that we can sort of trace back the history of our solar system in these rocks. But another reason why more recently, why people are getting very excited about learning about meteorites is because of their inherent value, like the amount of resources in them. Um, and when I first started doing this talk, like eight years ago, talking about asteroid mining was kind of with a sort of like sly little wink of like, oh, this is ridiculous. And it's increasingly like every year it's looking slightly less ridiculous, still probably quite a way off. Um, and it's not it's unlikely that people are going to be mining asteroids for their resources and then bringing them back to Earth much more likely that its people are going to use these as a way to get access to iron to build things in space. Still probably several decades, maybe even 100 years until this starts happening. But now there are a lot of companies out there that are very, very seriously considering how to do this sort of thing. Um, and so those people very, very much want to know what's in these meteorites and what can we do with it. But one of the biggest questions was another one that Chelyabinsk really hammered home. And that was, are we doing enough planetary defense? Are we doing enough to be able to protect Earth from these kinds of meteor impacts? And can we protect them from these kinds of meteor impacts? Because nobody saw that this meteor was coming. Um, it was completely, completely, nobody saw it until it was exploding in the skies over Russia. And so what can we do to be able to, to protect ourselves from it? Well, fortunately, um, both NASA and various other agencies around the world are trying very, very hard to make sure that we can find every single, uh, every single asteroid that is over a kilometer that comes within 0.3 AU of Earth, uh, one AU being the distance between Earth and the sun. 
So, and they reckon they found about 97% of those. I think it might have gone up to 98 now. Um, that remaining 1% are the ones that are coming out of the sun um, and, and, and are sort of obscured from view. And those ones, they are working on finding ways to try and be able to like narrow that down so we know about as many of these as humanly possible. And the longer these surveys go on, the smaller that window of where they can hide becomes. They are now working on being able to see the much smaller ones. So uh, they're looking for the ones over a kilometer because those are your civilization killers. Those are the ones that are, you know, will send us the way of the dinosaurs. Those like the, the we, we really need to do something about those. They're now concentrating ones down onto uh, that are over 140 meters across. Uh, those ones are classed as city killers. Um, so they would take out an entire city should they uh, impact one which could have you know, serious consequences to, to the people living underneath it, but also like global consequences as well for civilization wise. But the Chelyabinsk meteor was 20 meters across. They aren't even attempting to try and find these kinds of things. Um, and that is a little bit worrying, <laughs> but not too worrying because as we saw, it's like it was, enough that it did blow out some windows, um, but nobody was seriously hurt. They're actually done a lot of analysis on how the um, emergency services responded. They've done, you know, there's been papers written about, you know, how to respond to these kinds of events if something happens. So if something happens in the future, the medical response in statistics that are much larger than Telubinsk is also modified and helped by those kinds of reports, which I thought was really interesting to find out about. Um, but we do think we know about most of the, the really troubling asteroids that are crossing Earth's orbit. Um, this is a bit of a, uh, the, the, the all of the, the ones that we knew about. I think this is a couple of years old now, but you can see there are lots of asteroids which do cross or come close to Earth's orbit, but we do think we can find them. And why is it important to find them? Because if you can find them, you can do something about them. Uh, and I've now been able to add this slide in since I last gave this talk, which is we now know how to do something about them because we have done the first ever trial run, which was the DART mission uh, that happened, I think last year, or it might've been 2021. Sorry, my sense of time has gone a bit in the past couple of years, as I'm sure people can appreciate. But this was a mission that flew to an asteroid, uh, a, a, a double asteroid system, um, and impacted into the uh, Didymorphos, uh, the moon going around the larger asteroid to try and deflect its path. And this is what we think will happen and what people will do if a big meteor is heading its way towards Earth, if we ever find it. And if you can do something like this, 10, 20, even five years in advance, um, even a small change of a meteor's speed will hopefully mean that by the time it comes to Earth, Earth isn't there anymore. Um, it either gets there beforehand or it gets there too late and our planet has moved out the way and we're absolutely safe from it. And so that's what people are, are trying to, to make sure that we can do in the future. But to do that, you need to be able to find them. And so that's why people have been spending such a long effort. You also need to know how the space rock is going to react, which is why it's so important to know about things like how crumbly is an asteroid. If we slam something into it, is that going to slow it down or is it just going to break it apart? And then we're dealing you know, with a uh, shotgun rather than a cannon. Um, so that's one of the reasons why so many people are working so hard to investigate all of these different meteorites and all of these different asteroids. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me. Um, we've also had a couple of missions, but the, most of our knowledge about meteors um, and asteroids has been taken from, you know, meteorites on the ground. But we do have managed to send a couple of missions out there to go and investigate them in person, which I do talk about in my book, Robots in Space. So if you want to find out more, please do read there. Um, 
but that's my plug over now and my talk over. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me. And uh, I, I assume I could take questions, um, but please do feel free to ask. <laughs>